The loss of podcast. The loss of podcast. Uh, you know, the hey, sexy friend. He's making me his bitch. Maybe you want to get a piece of that. Pretty good. I want to talk about sexy teens. I was getting erections. It's a very creepy feeling. I can guarantee that underwear theft will come up again. None of this is relevant. Pokemon, Pokeballs. 750 milliliter bottle of rum. Welcome to the Volusi Podcast. A study in monology. This is your grumpy uncle Peter. He will say words at you. Maybe not being able to go out at all and interact with people the way I would like has had a negative impact on me because one of the things I considered doing this morning was writing a Mary Kondo porn. And so at first I was thinking, oh, you could you could write like the guy comes up to her and goes, Marie Kondo, this shirt does not spark joy. And she has to take it off and throw it away. And you, you can see where this is progressing to already. I don't need to really get into the details. If you don't understand, you just got to go back a few years or find those those interpersonal, personal time documentaries. Find those that had a storyline and you'll see how bad they can be. That's the kind of thing that if you don't watch the porn and you actually watch those little cutscenes, it's it's actually often pretty entertaining. I had friends over once and we watched a full homosexual porn film without any of the actual pornography. It cut off at the actual parts where they started to have sex. And we actually just watched the story uh, and it was based on CSI, which was cock scene investigation, which was, you know, the perfect choice, to be honest. And, and I could not have been happier with the quality of the acting and dialogue. And I seem to have hit the same stride. Maybe this is where I've missed my calling. Like I, I shouldn't be making podcasts. I shouldn't be working uh, at my, my day job. I should be going out and writing, writing really pornographic scripts with with real ingenuity and thought uh, and, and care put behind them. And then I was thinking, well, during the actual sex scenes, they could still use the, spark joy phrase like oh that's sparking joy i'm sparking i'm sparking something like that you would have to do it with more enthusiasm than i'm showing now but i'm sure the people in that position uh they would have more motivation than i have right now to to be enthusiastic about the voices and whatnot but i mean you could feed them the lines and the lines i think they write themselves once you have a concept and the concept of a marie kondo porn i think it's not going to be a series it's not going to be one of those like anal freshmen 16, 1 to 16. And you really have to watch all 16 to get the plot. You really have to know, you know, the depth of the characters. That was an innuendo, actually, if you didn't get it right away. To really understand it and enjoy it. I'm not going to write that. But if someone else wants to, if they want to take that idea, I mean, I, that would spark joy within me. Core question. What is the most inaccurate thing you have ever heard a foreigner say about Japan? Uh, The most inaccurate thing. Like we've had people make mistakes, but I have had a couple of times where people have made statements of fact that were completely incorrect. And one of them came from a coworker I had, and this was before I actually lived in Japan. Um, And he was a Korean guy. And there's a lot of fetishization, the sexuality of Japan. So there's a lot of... As we've discussed many times on this and some of my other podcasts, a lot of dirty stuff comes out of Japan and it hits some pretty out there extremes. They are always pushing the boundaries of what is acceptable. That, in a way, is kind of the appeal, but it's also a touching point for other cultures where they can say, look at this, these are depraved sexual deviants. And that's how they can look down on them and make themselves feel better. This happens not just between Japan and and Korea, which is actually the country I'm thinking about. This happens between a lot of different countries. Um, Because countries say negative things about other countries, just like people say negative things about other people to make themselves feel good. So I once had this coworker, and he was a lovely man. Like, I have nothing bad to say about him. But he had this one fact incorrect, and he would not be convinced otherwise. And he said to me, in 100% seriousness, while we were sitting uh, in the store, because this was back when I worked in a store, retail, 
that in a Japanese kimono, there was a pin in the back. And if you pulled the pin out, the whole kimono would just fall off to the floor. Now, I have never considered myself an expert of Japanese culture. I know judo, uh, and that's pretty much the only thing I could ever say I know I'm an expert about. But I knew enough about people putting on kimonos. I had seen it done. I had had a couple Japanese friends. I'd had a Japanese girlfriend. She'd worn a kimono. I got to see how they put it on. And the main thing is the obi or the belt. And it's really thick and big. It's that big padded bit around the middle. That's not just a single wrap. That goes around again and again and again. A lot of times they'll do this like little spin and they'll put it on. Taking that off is just as much effort. You can't just like undo it and it just falls to the floor. You have to unwrap it. Now, if you're really fetishizing Japanese culture, the unwrapping of it would be the sexual part. It would be the slow reveal. But because this guy had grown up in a culture that wanted to say that Japanese people were depraved, because Korea has a very negative view of Japan for a lot of historical reasons. I'm not going to get into those now. This is not a political podcast. And I'm also not going to take sides. I think everyone is both right and wrong at pretty much the same time all the time. Except me, I'm usually right. Let's just get that one out there right away. The times I've made mistakes are usually just a slip of the tongue, not actually me being incorrect. Let's move on from that. That's not what you came here for. So the unwrapping process was just as lengthy as the wrapping process. So for me, that fact that he presented was the most inaccurate thing. Now, there may have been some confusion with the summer yukata. So a kimono is a full-on formal gown. It's like head to foot, uh, usually long sleeves. One of the things I learned is that the very, very long sleeves at the wrists are only supposed to be worn by single women. And then once you get married, you actually wear a smaller wrist because they have like giant ones for single women. And the, the joke that I was told was that you're supposed to like wave them to attract men's attention. So that you did like basically like a bird or something. Uh, but basically it was a outward notification that you were single, which was an interesting concept I didn't know about. Now the yukata is a summer thing. So it's much, much lighter. It would probably come off much, much more easily. But it's still not just like a pin in the back you pull out and then her clothes explode off. That seems like a very anime video game fetish thing that doesn't really intersect with reality at any point. So if you have any questions or comments about Japan, I would love to hear them. And if they're inaccurate, I would love to just crap on them for a while. So you can send a message to voicelink.fm slash velocipodcast. Uh, you don't have to actually leave a voice message. It does both voice messages and uh, text. You could also send an email. You do all the other sort of more traditional things. I'm going to keep pushing that because the few times I've gotten people to actually leave a voice message, I've really enjoyed responding to them. <laughs> I'm just doing a lot of Quora questions because uh, my brain just hasn't been working lately. I think for the same reason most people's brains haven't been working lately. So Quora question. Could an Olympic Taekwondo fighter beat the average Joe? Now this is a vague insult towards people who practice Taekwondo. I don't practice Taekwondo. Uh, I have the same feeling a lot of people who study martial arts do that it's not the most effective fighting form. Uh, because you have a lot of trouble if you get taken to the ground. But a very high-level Taekwondo athlete would kick me in the head and knock my head off before I even got close to him, so taking him to the ground wouldn't be an option anymore. The irony here is that in the question it states, an Olympic-level Taekwondo athlete, and then puts them against an average Joe. So number one, this is an Olympic athlete. Like just by the very nature of being at the level to get into the Olympics. Like I say, if you put an Olympic swimmer against the average Joe in a fight, I would put my money on the Olympic swimmer because he's fit. He's strong. He's, you know, got stamina. He's just, there's just so much more there to work with. If they both have the same fighting ability, I'm going to take the healthier, stronger guy as an option. Now, Taekwondo, a lot of people say, yeah, not the most effective fighting style, but the average Joe has even less. 
So if you took someone who is mediocre at Taekwondo against the average Joe, I would expect the Taekwondo guy to win because he knows how to punch and he knows how to kick. Again, maybe not the most effective, but more effective than the average Joe who knows nothing. Like the ridiculousness of this question demonstrates the question asker is too dumb to formulate a good question in the first place because the question answers itself. An Olympic level athlete in almost everything could beat the average Joe because the average Joe is a piece of shit. I mean, the average Joe came up with this dumbass question in the first place. Answer the question. Could an Olympic-level Taekwondo fighter beat the average Joe? The answer is, you're dumb. I wasn't going to talk about coronavirus, but let's face it, I've been working. I have been at home with my kids. I haven't been thinking about anything else. I haven't been doing that much else. So, of course, this is what's resting in my mind. Every social conversation I have is about coronavirus. So this is kind of just what's resting in my head. So I really don't have anything else I can talk about. So I kind of have to. But at least we can try to extrapolate into the future of what could happen. And the question I've been having conversations with with people I know is, if coronavirus or something like it becomes the new normal, what does that mean for the changes in society as a whole. So one of the questions I had that I never had an answer to is my kids were born when touch panels were normal. And that seemed to me already to be like a big paradigm shift. Like they don't have to work with buttons. They don't do stuff with computers that I had to do. Now I was never particularly skilled, but I could, you know, swap out a modem. I could do some really basic things with my computer. Now the way devices are created, essentially if it craps out, it's finished. You have to replace it. And they're growing up with that. And it's teaching them a disposable mentality. And I thought this was a massive change to society that was coming. Because as they grow up, their expectations are going to align with that forever. It's going to change how people buy and view things. Now that also might end up having a big pushback. So they get to a point where they're like, no, we shouldn't just be throwing stuff away. We want products that last 30, 40 years, like the original TVs and the original washing machines, where you bought a washing machine and it was supposed to last forever. And washing machines still kind of do. You don't buy multiple washing machines over a decade, or at least you shouldn't be. So I was thinking it always goes one of two ways. It can kind of just keep going in that direction, or it gets to a sort of a weird limit, and then society pushes back and goes the other way. So coronavirus... And it's probably not coronavirus. It would be like a similar thing. Uh, right now we have a flu season. So it would be some kind of new disease season. Let's just say that. But it's, being, it's, a, it's, it's a more serious thing than the flu. Um, and people have to take care. So we have the isolation and the social distancing and all the stuff you've heard about way too much by now. Now, originally, the summer vacation in North America was aligned when kids had to be at home on the farm and they had to help out with the farm, and then they had to help out with the harvest, and then they went back to school. That's why you had summer vacation. So you have like a two-month period in North America where kids don't go to school. Now, most kids now don't work on the farm anymore, but because that's been in place, that's just going to become normal. So the idea, my first idea was if we get to a point where kids have to essentially isolate themselves for a few months during the new pandemic season, it would actually make sense to make that their new version of the summer vacation. So you just take those two months and you shift them to the time when they're going to be closing down schools anyways. My kids' schools are supposed to be open this week. Uh, and they've pushed it to the 19th. And then in Japan, at the beginning of May, there's a holiday called Golden Week. So there's a week where they just basically have a week off. So it would actually make more sense that if they just didn't go to school for between the 19th and the 1st of May and then start a golden week. And then you'd have like another almost full month of time when they weren't in school sharing diseases and catching stuff from each other. So I can see they get to the 19th and they just say, oh, well, we might as well just push it to golden week now. And then they don't go back until whatever, the 10th of May. But if this becomes an annual cycle, you might as well just make that period, that month, at least their vacation time. Because they're going to have to probably stay inside. They're probably going to have to stay at home. And then companies' holidays essentially need to align when people have to stay at home as well. Or you're going to have to make considerations for it. 
So since farming is not the industry it used to be, and kids might have to self-isolate, it actually would make sense if this becomes a regular occurrence for the kids' vacation time to align when they have to actually isolate themselves, which would mean holidays now become an isolation period. And then it takes me to sort of the psychological effects, again, long-term, of not having periods of time where you go out and play with your friends. You actually have periods of time where you now don't see your friends because you're not supposed to contact with anyone because we're afraid of catching diseases from each other. On a very personal note, I haven't had judo in three weeks, maybe a month now, and I've gotten pretty down about it. It's clearly an outlet for me, like a significant one where this is where my frustration goes. This is where I channel unused energy. This is where my anger gets diffused. So I always walk out of judo feeling better just about life. And that's supposed to be true of exercise. But lifting weights, doing chin-ups, doing yoga doesn't have the same emotional impact on me as judo. There's just an intensity there of fighting another human being. Even if I'm just having a really light night and we're just goofing around, wrestling, and no one's taking it too seriously. It's the style of activity, I think, that has always resonated with me, which is why I get so much more out of it. And I can actually like, you know, I want to go hard. I can find someone who wants to go hard that night. And we can fight really hard. And, you know, I can really barrel into him and, and he can fight back and push me down. You know, it's a different thing than just lifting a heavier weight. There's satisfaction there, I'm sure, but it's not the same thing as really battling another human being for an hour. And so then I thought, oh, if these new diseases become the norm, close contact sports might just not be a thing anymore. Like one of the things I'm sure sports like judo are worried about is that they become one of the clusters and then that becomes a news story. So like, let's say 50 guys who practice judo at this club got coronavirus and then those guys went to other judo clubs and they all got coronavirus. And now we have 100, 200 cases of coronavirus and in every news story, it's the word coronavirus and judo. And then no one wants to join judo anymore. And the sport actually slowly dies out because now they connect mentally combat sports and disease. Honestly, in the back of my mind, there's a, a little note that says like, you've been doing judo for 30 years. This might be it. Like this might be the end of that as a thing you do. And part of me is thinking, so what do I do instead? Because again, like my previous point, nothing gives me the same satisfaction. Nothing, I don't derive the same catharsis from other activities. Um, and not being able to have the close contact, that leaves me in a weird position where I now have to figure out what I'm going to do for the rest of my life to stay healthy. But also, again, it's that, that mental aspect of it that people don't talk about because it's always just been there anyways. And so that's kept me fairly even-tempered. So then I went back to my kids. And let's say they grow up, and this again becomes the new paradigm. This is the new norm. I was thinking that dating was going to be an interesting thing because now kids are going to be wearing masks 24-7 all the time. So you're going to get this weird thing where showing your mouth to other people is incredibly intimate. So right now you walk into a room, you see someone's whole face. Uh, in the future, let's say you walk into a room and you see their eyes and they have beautiful eyes. You see their nose, but it's a little squished up because of the mask. So it might look a little different, but you don't see their mouth. And the mouth is actually an incredibly important thing. And this would be like seeing someone's body for the first time. When they pull down the mask, when they show you the mask, that's actually in itself would become an act of intimacy because that's not something you do or see normally. It would be like a short skirt or an off-the-shoulder top where you're showing more skin than you're supposed to, so that becomes a sexual thing. So she's pulled her mask down. You can see her whole nose. Oh my God, did you see her whole nose? That was amazing. You know, I've been thinking about that for the last two hours, if you know what I mean. That could be the new norm. And right now, one of the big industries that's been hit is restaurants. So restaurants as a whole... Again, the feeling of going to a restaurant could change. There could actually be a feeling of risk. Because if you ever went to like a dive bar or a dangerous place, the feeling was different. It was exciting. And I could see there being a lot less restaurants because restaurants just overall can be less successful because let's say, honestly, fewer people go to restaurants in the future. 
So the restaurants would have to be special. They would have to be particularly hygienic. In Ninja News Japan this week, I was actually talking about a couple of places I went to. And the places when I saw another customer leave and they came out and wiped down the table with alcohol, I had more confidence to go back there. So the ones where I saw them take the actions that I felt they should take, I was now thinking, I want to come back to this restaurant because I've seen them ensure that the patronage is safe. But let's say going to a restaurant now in itself is also a more intimate act because you're like, let's go to a place that, you know, let's take that chance. Maybe we could catch this disease together. And that's a risk. And that changes the mentality of the people. Now, there's going to be lots of people who go like, oh my God, restaurants, tool of the devil. No one should ever go to those anymore. I mean, that's just, it's, it's insane that everyone, anyone would even consider it. Then I took that to the next step, which would be the weird pornography that results in this. And so what you're seeing right now is regular porn with someone wearing a face mask, or if they want to take the joke to the extreme, they put on a hazmat suit with a little bit cut out and they have sex that way. I've heard those exist. I haven't seen any myself because, you know, I, I, I don't look at that. I'm, I don't even know what you're implying right now. But that's a short-term thought. What you have to do is extrapolate this again into the general psyche of humanity about what this would mean for them mentally. So, so I don't know where this would go. It's not going to be the jokes that you see right now where just someone's wearing a mask while they perform intimate acts. It's going to be a change in how we feel about things when people are doing acts together. And of course, because pornography is all about, it's almost about breaking taboos and going further than you're supposed to go. I don't actually see where that could lead us, but I just see it as being a really, what we would consider now very weird. Again, in the future, that might be super normal. Having talked about it in so many different ways with so many of my friends, I mean, in some ways it might be good. It might actually bring back intimacy. So most likely people's memories are too short for this to have any sort of real long-term impact. This is going to be a blip in history. X amount of people caught it, X amount of people died, that's in the history books. And we're not going to see another virus like this for another X amount of years. In the interim, people are going to be like, oh, do you remember 2020? The first quarter of 2020 was crazy. Oh my God, I hope that never happens again. Let's go out and behave perfectly as we were before. Hopefully, there will be better preparation in the future. So again, it might not be coronavirus comes back. It might be a different one. But, you know, all the governments and stuff, now they've experienced this they're more ready for things as it happens. Like things get shut down sooner. Uh, people get correct information more readily. Again, if I've already experienced it, I would already kind of know what to do. And then if you get good information, I would follow up on it because yeah, I'm washing my hands more. I'm doing all the things you're supposed to do. I'm wearing a mask. I'm trying to like not touch things, you know, as best I can. But of course, it's almost impossible to not touch things. I haven't gone so far as to wear just gloves all the time, but that might be the next step. So we wear a mask and gloves. And again, taking your glove off could suddenly become some kind of weird intimate act when people see your hands and like, mm, didn't think I was going to see that today. I mean, since this is just a voice on the internet, if this became the norm, then the really exciting thing would be to see what's behind the voice. Well, let me tell you, that's a nightmare you do not want to experience. An old man who's losing his hair and getting a lot of wrinkles. I got nice boobs, though. Pretty much every podcast you've listened to has said the same thing. And it's, it's true. You know, wash your hands, take care of yourself, and be safe. Because we might not want the new normal. The Loss of Podcast. The Loss of The Loss of, the loss of, the loss of Podcast. The Loss of Podcast. Uh, you know, the soul will... Hey, sexy friend. He's making me his bitch. Thank you for listening. Leave a text or voice question or comment at voicelink.fm slash podcast. You can find the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Acast or go to velocipeter.com slash podcast, sexy out homies. As much, yeah, whatever. And that's the problem with being average. No, whatever. Being average is fine. I actually might cut this whole bit. Some ways it might be... Uh, I don't want to say any of that either. Jesus Christ, I don't know what to say at all.